so <clears throat> the title of my paper is um, Articulating Quantities When Things Depend on Whatever Can Be the Case. I have two citations um, I would like to put in front, kind of. One is by Martin Heidecker. He says, man can think in the sense that he possesses the possibility to do so. This possibility alone, however, is no guarantee to us that we are capable of thinking. The other citation is uh, by Gilles Deleuze. It goes like this. Further still, beyond the world of representation, we suppose that the whole problem of being is brought into play by these differences between the categories and the nomadic or fantastical notions, and the problem of the manner in which being is distributed among beings. Is it, in the last instance, by analogy or uh, univocality? Okay. So the world is everything that is the case. I would like to take this famous line from Wittgenstein's Tractatus as a starting point. The world is not the totality of things, he says, but that of facts. I would like to consider, inversely, the world as the totality of whatever can be the case. After this inversion, we can, a small deviation notwithstanding, keep with Wittgenstein's language came and call the totality of whatever can be the case, the totality of artifacts. Artifacts capture and embody acts of concentration, not things that have happened or are given. What distinguishes them as artifacts from facts is that they conserve an act of concentration by condensating this act into manifest form. My core interest in the following concerns the possibility of a philosophical grammar in which the act of con conception is an impliative. A philosophical grammar in which conceiving is engendering by inference. Ampliative inferences are, according to Kant, inferences capable of broadening a term's extension beyond the possibilities that were contained in the premises. Such thinking as conceiving cannot be captured by the synthetic analytic, uh, analytic distinction, as Kant was well aware. It is not deductive, it cannot easily be argued as inductive, and it seems to involve an aspect of inception, of beginnings. The brief sketch I would like to lay out in this paper to support such an interest in artifacts as condensations of intellectuality departs from exploring a peculiar proximity between Ludwig Wittgenstein, Martin Heidegger, and Gilles Deleuze. A proximity which stems from the common interest in the Kantian insight that reason somehow conditions experience, an insight which, in a somewhat un-Kantian way, is explored by all three of them in relation to acts of learning rather than objects of knowing. In their own individual ways, Wittgenstein, Heidegger, and Deleuze have evoked the ancient sense of matthesis as an art of such conditioned learning. They have embraced the challenge that for learning, the conditions can never be sufficient nor clear and distinct. In such a sense of matthesis, to which I will refer to as mathetical, learning is less concerned with representation or recognition than with an act of appropriation and inhabitation, of new capacities and abilities. Learning in a mathetical sense involves a kind of privation which inverses the usual sense of the word. It involves a privation which engages in a logic of giving, not depriving. I would like to extend on this aspect that for learning the conditions can never be sufficient nor clear and distinct. I will suggest to view artifacts in a broad sense be it software, architecture, film, music, a piece of technology, suggestions for policies, tools for financing, business plans, recipes, or theory books, as the manifest form of acts of learning. I will regard artifacts as cases, 
and dedicatedly not as singularities, as cases which are conceived and engendered by ampliative reasoning. Artifacts in such a view are condensations from the outer space of intellectuality. They are aliens from within, if you like. They are popularized and in that sense decapitalized acts of concentration. If it makes sense at all to say that they are, we can follow the leap from being to existence and claim that just like things are in so far as they are there, artifacts are in so far as they are here. If being corresponds to things as they are named and existence to things in their thingness, we can say that insistence corresponds to the phantasmatics of things in their pre-specific objectivity. I have five chapters with titles, I'll just read them. <laughs> Um, the first one is within the outer space of intellectuality. Wittgenstein had started to sketch out a philosophical grammar for addressing things as facts. A philosophical grammar for addressing things as artifacts considers things in their objective pre-specificity. It assumes they can be named in this pre-specificity which they manifest, but not by grammatical names, but by mathetical names, that is by polynomials. The literal meaning of polynomials is having many family names. Polynomials name heterogeneous things, hybrids that comprehend aspects of many generic lineages. Polynomials name things that have no natural belonging, if natural means natural belonging means that the identity expressed belongs to exactly one genus or genre. A mathetical context of polynomials uh, we can characterize as follows. For all sciences working with methods of pr probabilistic, factoring polynomials is as ordinary, as elementary, and as capability dependent as a, pr um, a practice of, com of composing more or less well-formed, more or less well-reasoned arguments in sentences is. Polynomials feature in systems of differential equations and they are especially useful when describing processes which do not unfold steadily in space and time, but with fluctuations. Polynomials allow to map probabilistically fluctuations wherever signals can be made out that come in patterns of waves. Polynomials are the building blocks of all sciences dealing with electrical technologies, just like grammar is the building block for dealing with sentential structure. Assuming such polynomial predic predica predicability of artifacts allows to see them responding to all the grammatical categories we know. Mode, the expression of tense, mood, voice, aspect, person, number, gender, case. Taking this grammatical perspective does not mean to involve polynomials now into the so-called linguistic term, but it does mean that there is some kind of languageability involved in probabilistic reasoning. Taking a grammatical perspective grants that factoring polynomials is not a purely mechanical procedure, but one which can be done with more or less intelligence. If we take the algebraic formula of a circle as an example, we can see that what this formula names is never fully given. Polynomial predication is not directly about the assignation of an object as a particular thing. The formula of a circle is the formula of any circle and needs further determination that cannot be deduced from what the formula contains in order to denotate a particular circle. The polynomial space of predication organizes a space where things intermingle in the pure generality which objects have that are regarded in their dissolution into pre-specificity. There are no particulars involved in this intermingling of pure generality organized by the polynomial space of predication. There is nothing to be counted yet. Such a grammar is formulaic, and the pre-specific identities it names are, to a certain degree, evoked. They are literally called out, summoned, a bit like daimonions, manifest voices out of the outer space of intellectuality we all engage with when we learn. 
This space comprehends virtually anything that can be thought rigorously. The attractive promise is that such a grammar, which regards artifacts as its polynomial articulations, may provide us with the ability for structural thought in domains where reason is not only insufficient, but also abundant. In other words, whenever we refer to the probable. The probable, I would like to suggest, is the outer space of intellectuality where all the artifacts that ever were, are, or will be here are conceived, breeded, and engendered. Algebraic structuralism, that is structuralism within conditions of abundant <coughs> and insufficient reason, concerns the genesis of acts of reasoning. What I would like to present in the following is a collection of loosely integrated lines of thoughts to approach such a way of thinking about the articulatability of quantities by polynomial predication. Matthesis. There was a time when the theory of forms of experience and that of the work of art as experimentation had maintained an intimate relation. In a somewhat outdated sense of the word, the arts were referring to the development of abilities very generally, to a sort of cunning reason and the sophistication of how we can carry out human endeavors in general. As such, the term comprehended a double makeup of the development of such abilities as arts and as techné. The Greek term techné seems to have been applied in a somewhat sophistical, pragmatical sense for comparing such developed or cultivated abilities. In its Latin translation as ars, this sophistical dimension was largely reoriented towards a more meditative frame of reference. In both cases, however, techné and ars were meant in a more general sense than any skill or craft in particular. And even more importantly, they both implied an infinite scale there can be no comprehensive definition, no delineation of how good we can get, we can learn to be in something. Abilities as abilities, both in arts and techné, cannot be mastered, strictly speaking. Developing them means learning in a non-transitive sense. Today, we have largely dismissed such a notion of learning in favor of giving an objective dimension to, um, um, to knowledge which we can learn to cultivate by what is today called literacy. Yet different than the old notion of matthesis, literacy is constitutively entangled within a logic of recognition. Attending to the literal assumes there is a naturalness of meaning to it. This leaves us with an insuperable helplessness when dealing with the fertility and autonomy of thoughts thought which they require within the outer, which they acquire within the outer space of intellectuality. Heidegger has paid attention to this alternative to the notion um, of literacy. He referred to it with cautious consideration as the mathematical and meant by it in an open sense that which can be learned. In Die Frage nach dem Ding, um, question of the thing, I don't know, from 1935-36, Heidegger comprehends genuinely philosophical thought as thought revolving around the notion of the thing. The mathematical is concerned with things, he says, <clears throat> in so far as we can learn about things, not simply how to use, uh, name them, master them, but rather how we can learn about things in their thingness, about bodies in their bodiliness, plants as plantness, etc. With these abstract terms, Heidegger does not refer to an idea of a thing, but to a certain kind of intellectual experience of an object as a thing in a certain appearance. Rather, he introduces the mathematical as that which, at one and the same time, gives things to us and allows us to learn about them. Quote, the mathematical, this is what we intrinsically already know about things, but we do, but we do not have it is what we do not have to extract or abstract from things, but what we, in a certain way, bring along ourselves. Learning, he continues, is a giving to oneself what one already has. It contains an element of a substantiality, which is for Heidegger, in, a cert in this certain mathematical way, <coughs> strictly personal. Um, 
Three, there is a naturalness proper to reasoning. Different than Heidegger, uh, Gilles Deleuze has suggested to consider a possible generalization of this peculiar element of asubstantiality that is involved in mathematical learning. He conceives of purity not as an attribute, but as an elementarity, as a transcendental quasi-naturalness proper to reasoning. This elementarity for Deleuze is conditioned by three inseparable principles, that of pure quantitability, complemented by those of pure qualitability and pure potentiability. Raising these terms, the quantitative, the qualitative, and the potential to the level of abilities is crucial for understanding Deleuze. <clears throat> he calls them principles, but manages to call them such in a way that they don't presuppose anything given by raising them to the level of abilities. These principles don't allow us to recognize, imagine, or picture ideas by thought. Rather, ideas bath in this pureness, and this pureness grants that thought is natural in a different way from assuming its good nature. Within such a setting, ideas, never, ideas need to be indexed. They need to be actively coded. This is how thought can engender thinking within this elementarity of pureness. Deleuze conceives of ideas as the differentials of thought, and thinking means determining, reciprocally, the differential relations contained within them. Thus, Deleuze presupposes a naturalness for reasoning which precedes the assignability of truth or falseness to, the, to any act of thought in particular. This naturalness itself provides neither sufficiency nor well-foundedness for emerging thoughts. Considered together, Deleuze's, Deleuze's ideas and the elementarity of pureness make up for considering reason not from the point of view of its conditioning, but from the point of view of inception, or as he calls it, its genesis. Precisely because he assumes a naturalness to reason, Deleuze can hold in a mathetical sense that reasoning depends upon learning. Deleuze inverts the analytical assumption of an objectivity of problems. There is an objectivity of problems for him, but it is given as ideas, of which he conceives as differentials. Hence, we cannot have representations of problems, we can only formulate them. Reasoning for Deleuze is the faculty capable of formulating problems in ways that allow for critique, and this means formulating problems in general. This way of formulating problems in general, I would strongly like to argue, is algebraic and symbolic, not literal or numeral in any direct sense. But it, let us look more closely at this articulatability of quantities within such a transcendentally empirical setup. A differential takes the fractional form of a ratio. If ideas are not what is represented or mapped in reasoning, if they are differentials which need to be formulated in order to pose the problem whose objectivity they embody, we cannot deal with the differential's fractional form as a ratio directly. We, we have to empirically, experimentally investigate the ratio, think the idea, the differential, by expressing it in a variety of forms. This is what polynomials allow for. Polynomials are algebraic ways of how to index ratios such that they can be put into symbolical terms that allow for a variety of ways of how to express the ratio's quantity. As algebraic expressions, ratios are put into an, an arrangement of terms which involve indeterminate variables and constant values. <clears throat> the sum of these terms either needs to equal zero or another version of the same <clears throat> of the same quantity articulated differently. That means factored differently. Like this, ratios can be algebraically expressed such that they can be determined strictly reciprocally. The identity postulated by algebraic equations is expressed as a relation of idempotency, as George Boole called it. <clears throat> algebraic expressions with polynomials allow for all the arithmetic operations except division, and division is precisely what is expressed in the form of ratios. <clears throat> like this, Deleuze can maintain that ideas can be tested 
by algebraically articulating the form as a differential, the ratio. He has extracted the philosophical consequences of this when he writes that quantitas, the Kantian concept of the understanding capable of grasping the quantum, things in their extension, cannot be regarded as powerful enough for dealing with the different kinds of generality at stake. He says, <clears throat> the zeros involved in the x over the y express the annihilation of the quantum and the quantitas of the general as well as the particular in favor of the universal and its appearances. The assumption of abundant yet insufficient conditions for reasoning allows for an empirical science of investigating the universal and its appearances. The particular and the general come to be therein. The toolbox of such experimental measuring concepts are representing the objectivity of something problematical only in so far as they are tools for learning to think. Deleuze regards Kantian concepts of the understanding quite plainly in favor of uh, such learning. Quote, as a concept of the understanding, quantitas has a general value. Generality here referring to an infinity of possible particular values, as many as the variable can assume. So far so good, but he continues, quote, however, there must always be a particular value charged with representing the others and with standing for them. This is the case with the algebraic equation for a circle, which signifies the universal of circumference or of the corresponding function. End of quote. The algebraic formula for a circle needs a symbolic investment in order to become apparent as a particular circle. This particular, hence, is not a given concrete, but an evoked appearance. An appearance engendered through a kind of abstraction which is purely symmetrical. It creates consistencies by testing the reciprocal determinations of differential relations. We have to dramatize ideas, as Deleuze calls it. The generalities are what can be extracted from abstract thought, not the other way around. Abstract thought does not presuppose the general as given. Thus, the validity of general forms can only be empirically grounded. Concepts can be created mathetically. They are grounded in a way, uh, they are grounded in what we have learned to conceive rigorously. Just like in the case of Heidegger, for whom such mathetical learning is a giving to oneself what one already has, is strictly personal. Also Deleuze's notion of reasoning as learning is enacted by personas. But for Deleuze, attending to the thingness of things means attending to ideas within the outer space of intellectuality. And this is only possible if we actively dramatize them. Both Heidegger and Deleuze assume a dynamism which allows such attending or dramatization. For Heidegger, this dynamism takes the mechanical and in that sense self-sufficient form of a proof which pivots around the given axis of time. This self-sufficiency is opened up by Deleuze. He allows the mechanical, linearly circular dynamism. Heidegger calls his notion of proving Kreisgang, going in circles, to follow lines of light which always depart from, one, from what one has just learned. Three, a locus in quo of imaginary points and figures. <clears throat> Let us raise some of the background issues to algebraic numbers and symmetrical quantities. In 1883, Arthur Cayley, a British algebraist working on variational calculus and invariance theory, gave his presidential address of the British Association for the Advancement of Science in London with the following endeavor. There is a notion, he, t uh, he told his fellow intellectuals, which is, quote, really the fundamental one, and I cannot too strongly emphasize the assertion underlying and pervading the whole imaginary space in geometry. It is hard to see at first what this statement implies and why he holds it of such importance to devote his entire speech to it, and this with such a tone of gravity in his voice. Has not geometry, at least since its analytic turn to the Cartesian space of abstract representation, lost its cosmologically ordered elementarity in favor of merely providing an imaginary plane for experimental sciences. 
Haley's voice is not a solitary one at that time. Uh, within the last decades of the 19th century, Dirichlet, Kummer, Kronecker, Weierstrass, they all wrote about the notion of quantities involving algebra. And Husserl published, I think in 1889, his habilitation on the notion of quantity. Um, Dedekind wrote, what are numbers, what are they for? Russell wrote his, uh, his PhD, The Origins of Geometry, 10 years before the Principia. Whitehead published a comprehensive volume entitled Universal Algebra, also before the Principia. So this was really a troubling issue at the time. But what exactly is Cayley referring to with this imaginary space in geometry? What had happened? The crucial sentence is the following specification Cayley gives. Quote, I use in each case the word imaginary as including real. Both terms, imaginary and real, are meant in their number theoretical sense. But nevertheless, the issue Cayley wants to address is not one dedicatedly for mathematicians. Quite the, quite the contrary, his concern is, quote, this has not been so far as I am aware a subject of philosophical discussion or inquiry. The issue raised in this address concerns the grand question of whether and in what sense a notion of space is relying on experience and subjectivity. Yet the extraordinary take it presents for philosophers is that this question is raised out of the field of number theory. This is an unusual perspective. How can we philosophically conceive of space such that it features, quote, as a locus in quo of imaginary points and figures, or in other words, as the scene of the event of a peculiar kind of elementarity where figures are articulated out of a numerical domain of which we must, somewhat paradoxically, try to understand that it literally includes the real. By including the real is meant that the numerical domain at stake is said to extend beyond the infinite number line of real numbers. In their continuity, the domain of the real numbers comprehends all the positive and negative integers, zero, as well as all the rationals and the irrationals. It is indeed difficult to picture mentally what could be left out by the real numbers, but this is precisely the point of Cayley's address. From the perspective of number theory, Cayley questions, Cayley's question considers the possibility of a kind of intellectual intuition, and it considers that the quantitative may host something like forms of construction, which might heave off such a notion of intuition out of the threatening swamps of the unconditioned revelation in a mystical or theological sense. The imaginary domain he is referring to is that of the complex numbers. And what this domain allows, as we could perhaps put it, is operations on real infinities. The crucial point about them is that their conditioning cannot be thought of as natural. If we understand by natural, it's more conventional notion, not the Deleuzian one, namely that the quantities describing it need to be factorizable in a unique and necessary way, according to an assumedly universal order of primes, <coughs> prime numbers. This may seem like a fancy question for number crunches and not for political, philosophical intellectuals, but just consider that none of our electronically maintained infrastructures today would be working without those quantities. And yet, their usage is still today commonly put into rhetorical brackets which claim that only the real part is of, uh, of these operations was of importance, whereas the imaginary part is called but a technical trick, which can be applied when dealing with symbols. Contrary to this view, Cayley raised the question concerning the nature of such tricks. Can there be, in short, something like an intuitive rendering present by intellect, such that we can learn to say something reasonable about the conditions of this rendering present? even though we cannot assume any necessity for it to appear as it appears. What was preoccupying Cayley and many others in the second half of the 19th century was the unsettling suspicion that we cannot exhaustively address reality by investigations following the Cartesian formula verum et factum convertuntur. The statues of numbers had grown problematical in a new way um, 
with this newly developed capacity to render present symbolically and in so far intersubjectively by acts of intellection. Considering the symbolicalness of symbols, the troubling question can be put like this. How can we conceive of the symbolicalness of symbols in universal algebra? For Whitehead, it was an open question. For Russell, just as for Husserl, it was clear that assuming for symbols a status of their own, one that is not grounded in geometry or arithmetics, nor in language, would be profoundly misleaded. They both held firm, albeit in different versions, that symbols need to regard necessary facts. Yet with algebraic expressions, there is an objectivity proper to symbolic encodings that allows to encode, that allows the encoded to be referred to and represented in purely general terms. This generality is not gained by strictly deductive reasoning. It nevertheless does not depend upon psychological subjective experience. Conceiving of a genuine symbolicalness of symbols means tackling with the primacy of abstract algebra as a means for formulating symbolic constitutions. These constitutions provide the structures for what can be expressed as the cases of this peculiar algebraic generality. Strictly speaking, the fundamental theorem of algebra leaves the general applicability of arithmetics problematic. If algebra is granted a universal status, applying arithmetics turns into a practice of engendering solutions as cases, that is, of calculating solutions which are not, strictly speaking, necessary solutions. For the majority of philosophers, an affirmation of this would be a straightforward capitulation of Enlightenment philosophy at large, because it means that the strong link between calculability and necessity were broken, and along with that, the distinction between philosophy as metaphysics and philosophy capable of critique. Yet if algebra's universal status is considered as complementing a probabilistic element into which the formula that is the algebraic identity as a relation to be established, is seeked to be integrated, all that the fundamental theorem of algebra asks for, philosophically, is to ascribe a different modality to the abstract objects of mathematics and logics than that of necess necessity and contingency. I read Deleuze's concept of the virtual along these lines as the modality for the experienceability of things which are not merely possible but real. Virtually real means in principle fully determinate, yet never actually exhaustively determinable. We can consider the virtual as the modality of the things engendered by abstract thought. The symbolicness of symbols encodes forms of structure for determining unknown quantities and is itself neither form nor content. Such algebraic quantity expressions can be considered pure in a quasi-Kantian sense they make reference to no specific magnitudes at all and work only with conceptual definitions. Whitehead uh, writes about such vectors of imaginary ver verticality, quote, it sets before the mind by an act of imagination a set of things with fully defined self-consistent types of relations. As a coda, um, <laughs> without specific title, Aristotle had performed a bold move when he appropriated, when he appropriated from the Olympian gods their mark of distinction, their family names as a sign of belonging to different generations and genera. And when he claimed this divinely distinctive mark to be applicable to all there is, all there is, is things that can be named, he writes. And he sets out to consider it seriously. So once people had started to conceive of the mystical happenings in terms of philosophical consequences and inferences between things that can be named, a structure was needed to receive and conserve the voices of the mythical personas. Words originally simply meant verbs. I didn't realize that, even though I studied literature originally. Very amazed. So abstract acts in infinitive form. <clears throat> Energeia was Aristotle's term for such an abstract principle of actuality. With the verbs 
Grammar was providing a structure to receive and conserve the mythical voices by distinguishing grammatical cases as a sort of a negative form in which we can encounter things that can be named affected by energeia, as involved into an actuality at play with the verbs. We still commonly today say, albeit we mean it in a largely technical and sterile sense, that grammatical cases are the structures provided to receive and express what is decadent, what is falling or declining. This is where the term casus comes from. Language and its grammar solves the threat of decadence for community by turning it into a problem to be articulated. As such, it needs <clears throat> not be solved anymore. The effect of expressing the threat in language literally dissolves, dissolves it by probabilizing the forms in which it might appear. These articulated expressions have led a fertile life within the space of probability and intellectuality. Entire populations of words have been conceived, engendered and raised, which allow for this enormous richness in articulating what may be the case. The real metaphysical question today, I think, is not about being's analogy or university. It asks us to actively value and esteem artifacts as the conditions for everything that can be the case. The real metaphysical question today is how we can account for polynominality and the spatial-temporal dynamisms they engender. Thank you.